Now back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm Dr. Rita Louise and thank you for staying tuned to the second hour of the show. So we're going to continue our kind of spooky fest because you know it is going to be Halloween coming up here in the next couple of days. And to share this hour, we're going to be speaking to Jim Harrell because he has a new book called Campfire, True Ghost Stories. So part of me wants to get me to tell you to turn your lights off and, you know, get a blanket and maybe some marshmallows and be prepared to be scared. Don't forget, Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com and the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. But let me tell you a little bit about Jim, and we'll get him on the air. In 2005, Jim Harold started podcasting on the paranormal. His lifelong interest in the supernatural, combined with his love of broadcasting and technology, resulted in the most successful web-based programs of this, their type in the world. The Paranormal Podcast, Jim Harold's, Camp, Jim Harold's Campfire, and The Paranormal Report are regularly among the top podcasts in their categories on iTunes, often outranking programs from the biggest mainstream media publishers. And you can find information about his work at jimherald.com. So let's get Jim on the air and find out what all's going on. Hey, Jim, how are you? Oh, hello. I'm doing great, and I'm so glad to be on the program. Thank you so much for inviting me. I look forward to it. You know, Halloween's coming, as you say, in a few days here, and it is indeed one of my favorite times of the year, one of the best times of the year to to, to share spooky stories. Well, you know, I joke around a lot. I mean, I'm a psychic investigator for a ghost hunting group and I'm scared of the dark and so I make a lot of jokes about like don't turn off the lights don't turn them off but Jim how did you get interested in ghosts and the paranormal well really I've been interested in this topic um, my whole life and, and, and getting into podcasting was almost the perfect confluence of my various interests I'd gone to school to be a broadcaster and ended up working on the business side of radio and did not end up broadcasting, and I ended up in my mid-30s saying, geez, I'm not going to do this. Uh, And I kind of, you know, my life's ambition was kind of, um, had fallen to the wayside. So I I heard about this thing called podcasting, and uh, and I've always had a love for technology and a love for broadcasting. I'm like, I ought to do a podcast, because I've listened to some of these, and I think I can hold my own with some of them. And uh, But then I said, well, what to do a program on? And I tried to think of different things. I thought of music, you know, and that's that's hard to do because of rights issues or politics or history or whatever. I thought, well, really, what is the one thing, if you go into a bookstore or library, where's the first section you go to? What's fascinated you your whole life? Um, And it was the paranormal. And I have, from a very small age, been interested in the paranormal. Uh, You know, if you remember that old show, In Search Of, with, Leonard Nimoy. Leonard Nimoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never missed an episode of that. And I was always fascinated in that kind of style, but there wasn't a lot. I mean, other than Coast to Coast AM, there really wasn't a lot out there that kind of took an inquisitive look at the paranormal. So I thought, well, I'll do my own show, and, and, and you'll get a kick out of this. This is what I think was funny. At the time, I thought, well... I could do this show for six months. It'll be great because I'll have all the answers to these mysteries. And uh, six years later, uh, I've done hundreds of shows, and uh, it turns out that I have way more questions than when I started. And I somehow suspect if I continue doing these shows and do hundreds and thousands more, I'll have even more questions because uh, these uh, th- these questions are difficult ones but uh, fascinating nonetheless. Well, and it seems like different people have different points of view that they bring to the table, and it's not that they're right or wrong. It's just a different point of view that always makes me, and I'm sure you go, hmm, that's possible. Well, yeah, I find myself doing a lot of it. Well, that makes sense, and that makes sense. Well, that makes sense. And uh, on our programs now, I have a few different programs. You mentioned uh, my main programs 
the Paranormal Podcast, which has been the one my, still my highest rated show and the one that I've been doing since 2005. A couple of years back, I uh, started this uh, program, uh, Jim Harold's Campfire, and that's basically just average people uh, telling their personal stories of the supernatural. And, and I'll talk about that a little more in a minute. And then the Paranormal Report with Clayton Morris, uh, and that is a video news podcast. So uh, it's uh, the Paranormal News of the Week. And then I do some other podcasts, including Weird News Radio with Kate Patello and some things. But um, the thing about the Campfire Program, when I started it uh, a couple of years back, it's been about two and a half years now, is I thought, well, this will be a nicer diversion. This will be something where people can tell their stories, and it will be fun. And it, it is fun. I don't want to downplay that. But it's actually turned into, and, 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 and obviously in, in respect to your title, I don't, I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on TV, but it's almost become like a paranormal support group in the sense that people feel like they can tell their stories and other members of the audience will relate to them. They'll share their own stories. They feel like it's a safe space. And never in my wildest dreams did I think when we started this that people would this would mean something more to them than just entertainment. But a lot of people have been waiting a long time to get these stories off of their chest because they're just so chilling and they had such an impact on them many times at a very young age that uh, it's been great. It's spooky. It's touching at times. It's poignant at times when we talk about um, communication from uh, loved ones uh, who have passed over. So it's all those things rolled into one. And, and the reason I did the book was is because when I looked at it, I thought, well, there's only a certain amount of people who are ever going to listen to a podcast because – for some reason, that scares people away. When it, we know that it's basically just an internet radio show that you can listen to anytime you want. That's podcast is a fancy word for it, and I think it tends to scare people off. Um, but I said pretty much everybody will read a book. So why don't we take the best of the best stories that we've had and compile them into the book? And that's what you've got with Jim Harold's Campfire True Ghost Stories. It's a, a cornucopia of seventy-three supernatural stories and. Uh, and, uh, and I hope everybody gets a chance to check it out. And I think your show and the book is great that way because I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, that so many people have some kind of ghostly encounter or some kind of paranormal experience in their life, but they don't really either recognize that they're having a paranormal experience or they tell themselves that they're crazy. But by hearing other people's stories that are similar to theirs makes them go, oh, well, maybe that was true, or maybe I'm not crazy, or maybe that was Grandma that came to visit me last night. I uh, Exactly. You know, uh, and, and there are all kinds of stories. Do you mind if I share one with you? Sure. Okay. Well, here's one that's one of my favorites in the book, and it speaks to uh, the idea of premonitions. And even premonitions when you don't realize that it is some type of premonition. One of our guests, and the other nice thing about the show, is we have people who listen and contribute from all over the world. I have stories from the U.K., I have listened, uh, stories from Canada, from Colombia, from Norway, from Germany. So we have you know a nice sampling of uh, international stories. And this caller was from Canada. But she was traveling to uh, Hungary, where her family was from, and I believe she may have been very early, and it was her and her husband who went to Hungary in Eastern Europe. And uh, a relative had arranged to pick them up at the uh, train station and uh, had arranged for them to stay in a, an apartment so they could you know, stay there reasonably. So this uh, relative picked them up uh in the, the wee small hours of the morning, everybody was exhausted. They deposited them at this uh, apartment, and they were showing uh, the couple around the apartment, and the, the woman, my caller, told the, the proprietor, the person in the building, uh, you see that bed over there? That has to be moved over to the, to the other side of the room. Uh, now, the funny thing was that she was insistent on this. She had no, absolutely no idea why she was insistent on it, but she just knew that for whatever reason, and she couldn't really figure out it was she, but she just knew that that had to be moved. And they argued back and forth for quite a while. Not only she with the owner of the apartment, but with her husband. She said he basically said, you know, this 
it's two, three, four o'clock in the morning, whatever it was. And uh, this is ridiculous. But she stood her ground, and they did, in fact, move it. And this is heavy European furniture, so it's not something that's easily moved. So they've been sleeping for a couple of hours, and then they hear a huge crash, the couple, the young couple. And at first they thought it was such a loud crash, and there was glass and breaking and all kinds of things. They thought that it was... uh, It was a car uh, crashing into the apartment. They turned on the lights, and it turned out to be there had been a huge bookcase with glass full of heavy books. That whole thing had come toppling down right where that bed was, almost certainly killing whoever is in that bed if that bed's still there. The next morning... They went and they they showed the proprietor the damage. And he said, I can't believe that because that bookshelf has been there for 50 years. I grew up coming to this house that belonged to his family. And he said, that bookshelf has been there very sturdily the the whole time I've been cognizant. And just this one night it happened to topple and she happened to have that feeling. Now, you can't tell me there isn't something to that. That can't just be coincidence. That's why, you know, again... I believe in this stuff. Do I believe in all of it? No. But I think that there are cases like this one that are just so incredible that it's hard to deny that there isn't something very strange going on. I know. I I wish I had, like, some horror movie little sound clip that I could be like, (laughs) you know, (laughs) to play with that. That's kind of creepy. And, you know, working as an intuitive... I just think that it's great that she listened to herself and got the bed moved. Absolutely. I agree. I'll tell you uh, another story, uh, which is one of my favorite topics. This one is not in the book. It's a later story. It may actually end up being, I I say, you know, we continue to produce the the podcast every week, the Campfire Program, and I'm very uh, uh, confident that there'll probably be a book two or a book three of the campfire story, and certainly enough material. This is one of my favorite stories. It's not in the book, but this will also give your listeners a flavor of the type of stories that are in the book. Uh, a man was working at a construction site, and uh, he had a little portable transistor. I guess they still kind of show my age there, calling it a transistor radio, but a transistor radio of some type. And uh, they were listening to it on the job site, and it got dampness in it or whatever and started to fail. So he came home from work and put it on the kitchen table and didn't really think about it. And I guess he was having dinner with his wife or whatever, and they were talking about family experiences. And the the, the story turned back to, to some loved ones who passed away, in particular his sister. And all of a sudden, the radio comes to life. And it's playing a song by a particular singer. Um, the song was So Far Away, and the singer was uh, Carol King, that, that great singer-songwriter. Uh, the, 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 the strange thing about that, Carol King, I've got to get that right. Uh, the strange thing about that is that uh, his sister was a singer. Her favorite singer was Carol King, and her favorite song was So Far Away. That got my attention. Mm-hmm. I'm getting little goosebump things. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> the thing. is, And I believe that our loved ones, in some cases, try to communicate with us. I don't think, in my mind, there's no doubt about that. I had a situation with my brother. And another thing I put in the book was a section called Eating My Own Dog Food. And what I meant by that were things that had happened to me personally or to family members that I was familiar with before, you know, I ever did these podcasts. And one of the stories was, um, uh, you know, I have a premonition story in there and uh, a couple, and one just kind of fate story, but one is about my brother. My brother was autistic, and he died very young. He was, uh, what would have he been, 27? And uh, he died in 1999. And... uh he was autistic, and and he passed away tragically, uh, unexpectedly. And uh, he lived down south in a rural area. And me and my uh, 
my wife, uh, I'd only been married a couple of years at that point, went down to the funeral and we're coming back. And I was flipping around the stations just to have some kind of diversion. And it's one of those, it's southern Ohio is where we were at at the time. So, you know, anybody that travels in rural areas, you have radio stations that come in and come out and come in and come out. And there was this one sta- uh, station that played standards, and uh, like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Nat King Cole. And I've always, you know, I love all kinds of music, and that's one of my favorite types of music. So that came on, and I thought, well, that'll be good. And anyway, and this is very similar to the So Far Away story, um, this instrumental comes on. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. I've heard this somewhere before. The band sounds familiar. It was very old-fashioned music. Didn't, I wasn't particularly crazy about it, but it was playing, and you know, I just figured let it play. Like, that sounds, that sounds very familiar. And the DJ comes on and says, well, that was of course Lawrence Welk with his big hit, whatever it was, from 1960. Well, the funny thing is, is that my brother was autistic and he had some you know his tastes were a little different growing up and and he would have been about 40 now uh he would well, my goodness he would have just turned 40 uh, a couple of weeks ago um one of his favorite tv shows to watch as a kid was the lawrence welk show and we were coming home from his funeral and and what i would say was it would be different if it were michael jackson were his favorite person, and I had the radio on and a Michael Jackson song came on, because that would be a very common thing to hear. When was the last time you turned on the radio and heard a Lawrence Welk tune? So to me, that was my brother saying, big brother, don't worry about me, I'm okay, and I just wanted to get this message to you. And I think stories like that are so important, because I agree with you. I think that it is family trying to say hello, we're around, we're okay. But people have to be cognizant of that's how they communicate with us sometimes. I agree, and I I think that it's comforting. It made me feel a lot better, and I wrote about it pretty extensively in the the book. And I I think that's a great comfort. And let's say that it is wrong, and it, it wasn't my brother. Well, there's something to be said about the therapeutic value of me thinking that it was my brother. But I, I do I do believe it was my brother. But the thing is, I don't want your listeners to get the wrong idea. This book is not all sweetness and light. There are some stories in here that will uh, chill you and thrill you. One of my favorites, and obviously I don't want to tell every story in the book because I'd love for people to pick it up. And the best place to go, I, I'll put this note out here, is jimherald.com that's j-i-m-h-a-r-o-l-d dot com and from there you can get links to amazon.com barnesandnoble.com and it's also available at bookstores everywhere not too long ago one of my fans uh, sent feels weird to say I have fans one of my friends on Facebook um, who follows the show they sent me a picture of the book at the Barnes and Noble at Fifth Avenue in New York and that, that was that was thrilling to see that's then cool. I knew it was real but um, we've got some background here, so I apologize. Some uh, sirens or something going by the window. But but not all the stories are sweetness and light. There's a story in there which I call the spookiest story in the book, and it's about a young lady who played with a... Wait, should I turn my lights off? No. Well, I don't know if you'll want to turn them <laughs> off after you Okay, hear, uh, listeners, hear you turn your lights off so you can be scared. I'll leave mine on. Okay. So So anyway... Uh, they were playing with the Ouija board and calling up different incantations and things. And, uh, and, and, and the story's more involved in this, but they had a little lava lamp next to the Ouija board. And there was a very strange feeling in the room and so forth. And they were playing with the Ouija board, and all of a sudden they look over to the lava lamp. And you remember the gloopy stuff in the middle of those lava lamps? Do you, do you remember what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, usually it's just like a glob, right? Not too often you see it turn into the face of a devil and look at you. That's what happened to her. No. <laughs> yeah, that's what she claims, and I believe her. And, and uh, you know, that's that's a point I want to make. I, you can kind of tell when somebody's putting you on and when they really believe you. And the people that uh, are featured in this book and, and did the program, they really had no... 
there's nothing in it for them to to make something up or lie. Uh, I've always had the feeling the vast majority of people I talk to are very sincere in what they saw, and they believe that they saw what they saw. Now, you know, maybe somebody mistook an airplane for a UFO or something like that. I can certainly believe that. And my little moniker on all of this is that I believe that maybe 95% of what's called the paranormal is not the paranormal, but totally explicable whether by scientific means or by the fact somebody's just mistaken. Uh, Some people do have mental issues that will make them think they see things that they don't see. Or, unfortunately, there are some people out there who hoax. We know that that's the case. But let's just say that that's accurate. Let's say that 95% of these cases are false. Well, that means 5% are real. And that 5% based on all of the reports of paranormal activity through the big umbrella from UFOs to cryptozoology and everything, that would lead us to have millions of legitimate cases. That's not something to ignore. So, again, my my motto with all of this is you need to keep an open mind, not so open that your brains fall out, but I, <laughs> I think that sometimes the, sometimes the hardcore skeptics kind of miss the boat. What I told, I've had Dr. Michael Shermer, probably America, along with uh, James Randi, America's foremost uh, expert uh, in in skepticism on. Nice guy. Totally disagree with him, but a nice guy. But what I told told him and I told Joe Nickel and I told other skeptics, you know what? In 97% of the cases, we're probably in total agreement. Where I have a problem with you guys is in that 3 or 4%, you still close your mind and you, you still say, that it's uh it's it's not uh it's not real. And that's uh that's what annoys me is when skeptics say, Well none of this can be true and then they, what they will do is throw up blanket objections n- not specific to the case. And I can share an interesting story with you on UFOs if you'd like me to. This one's not in the book either. Actually, actually let me let me ask let me ask a question. Let's come back to that. Okay. But let me ask a okay. question about the skeptics. In the people yeah. that call how many of them actually were skeptics or consider themselves skeptics but have had an experience that made them stop and think, well, maybe what I believe I shouldn't anymore? I wouldn't say it's the majority. I think the majority of the people by nature who call into the programs are believers, as it were, but I do have people. And and to me, in some ways, these are the most impressive accounts. Not that I discount people who are believers or have had a lot of uh, things happening to them, because I do believe certain people are more in tune with the spiritual world and the other side in these kind of experiences. So I think it's natural some people will just have a lot of experiences. That doesn't make them any less real. It just means that they are more of a magnet to them. But there are people, maybe 20%, 30%, I don't know. That's just anecdotal on my part, but who will call in and say, Jim, nothing has ever happened to me, except this one time. And that's one of my favorite things, because you'll talk to people, and they'll say, I don't believe in that stuff. And then out of the mouth, the next sentence is this. But there was this one time. (laughs) 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 And I bet you, if you take the skeptics and you take everybody and put them in a big pool, and they all tell the truth, they would all say, you know, a lot of people would say, I don't believe in that stuff. That's all crazy. But there was this one time, and that's what I find so fascinating, and a lot of those one times are what make up the the campfire book. And I find that once somebody has an experience of their own, it it changes their world. I mean, we're going to come to the UFO story because I think people that see UFOs, either they think they're crazy or that experience changes their life. Mm-hmm, hmm Well, uh, UFOs are interesting. I, I think now is a tough time for UFOs from the standpoint is so many people have cameras, and there's so many things that can be doctored via computers and so forth. I mean, you could do things on, you know, if you have a teenager with a decent home computer and some software, they could do things that, uh, you know, Hollywood would have to do 20 years ago or 10 years ago, and they could do them right on a computer. So a lot of times when we have youth, uh, YouTube footage and things like that, it's kind of it's kind of tough to put stock in it because I'm not a photographic or a, a video uh, 
uh, analyst. And I, you know, I can't do forensics on video, so I can't tell what's real or what's not. But what I can tell is what's real is when people that I know, people I trust, or people who, in general, have good reputations, uh, tell uh, tell stories. Uh, I tend to believe those people. And this is not in the book, but and, and the thing is, is that a lot of times I'll refer to things not in the book because, you know, I've done over, I've done about three hundred, probably with all my shows, well over four hundred shows. So I have a large bank of stories to choose from, and, and, and sometimes, you know, when we're talking about a point, uh, I think it uh, kind of illustrates it the best, and this one I think does. Um, when I was in college in the early 90s, I had a professor who was a broadcasting professor, do, uh, Dr. Bob Jacobs, and he was a fantastic uh, broadcaster, fantastic teacher. And at that time, I remember him telling a story and this is very well publicized, and I'll explain that in a minute, um, a story about a UFO sighting that he had when he was in the Air Force. In the early 60s, he was in the Air Force, and he was uh, in charge of or, or had a part in the filming of, and this was actually filming, this is when they used film, you know, and, it, and put it in a can and all of that stuff, filming missile tests. And he literally uh, saw... Uh, something blow up a test missile. Basically, some craft or something basically circle a um, missile while it was in flight, uh, shoot what looked to be lasers or something at it, and then it disintegrated. And he reported it back, and they took his film and said, you'll never speak of this again. Now, I heard that story probably in 1990 or 1991, way before I did any of these shows. So anyway, fast forward to a couple of years ago, it was Robert Hastings, who's done a lot of work with UFOs and the fact that a lot of times they'll be spotted over nuclear bases and, and sometimes even speculated that they've brought the missiles offline, which is frightening, and frightening the, the fact of the missiles themselves, but it gets even more scary when you think maybe something else is controlling them. So anyhow, uh, he was telling the story and I swore that he was telling the story of this professor I'd had 20 years earlier. I didn't say anything during the show, and I said, after the show, I asked him, um, are you talking about Dr. Bob Jacobs? And he said, yes. It turns out that this became quite a thing. Uh, Dr. Jacobs went on Larry King Live. He told his story, and Bill Nye, the science guy, um, basically threw up the blanket objections. Well, it was a ball lightning or whatever whatever the, 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 the excuse du jour was. And my professor, who I absolutely, my favorite professor of all time, absolutely loved the guy. Very spunky guy, though. He wouldn't want to cross him. He said, listen, pal, I know what I saw. And that's the thing about him is I don't think he had another paranormal story ever. And this is somebody I know, somebody I respect, uh, like yourself, Ph.D., uh, a great broadcaster, was in, uh, worked in, in private industry and worked for the networks, uh, had a great reputation. What would he have to gain to go on Larry King Live and tell this story? Except that it's, it just happens to be the truth. And those kind of stories resonate with me, too, when you – back to your original question about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> um, I just somebody, think with when, that story – I, I just think that with that story, what's interesting is that, okay, they sent a missile up, it disintegrates, and the military's not all over that. Excuse well, they me? they may have been all over it, but they didn't want us to know about it. And again, that is not, but, I don't want to mischaracterize it, that one's not in the book, but I think it's a good example of your question have been, well, what about people who don't have these experiences, but they do, you know, how many people say they're skeptics? I don't know if he was a skeptic, but I, he would never strike me as a true believer. In those stories, a lot of times I get people say, you know, Jim, you know, I've never experienced anything else, but there was this one time, and this is what happened. And those, I think, even stand out more because it's just maybe not a part of their, their general makeup that they, that they have a lot of experience. Hmm. My sister told me she saw a UFO over at the school we went to growing up, and I'm like, you did? And I just heard about this last year. I'm like, why didn't you ever tell me about that? Why am I, why am I just hearing about this now? Well, that's actually an interesting <laughs> point, though. I think a lot of people hide 
or, or are afraid to tell people of their experiences because if uh, they'll think they'll be laughed at. I bet if you asked her um, and, and ser- got a serious answer from her, I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't say, well, I didn't want to say anything. You would have thought I was crazy or something along those lines. And and that's the thing I love about the campfire. And, uh, you know, I think our current movement you know, the paranormal's always been popular. It always will be popular. But, I mean, lately it's become more accepted to talk about. And I think that's a good thing because, uh, my goodness, I, I don't think that sh- if you have an experience, I don't feel that you should have to feel that you're you're, you're you're closeted about it. But I feel you should be able to speak out and say, hey, this is what happened to me. I don't know what it is, but this happened to me. I, I think that has great value. So with my show and my book, can pay, play a small part in trying to to, to bring people out and uh, out of their shell. Um, uh, then I'm very happy about that. In fact, I'll invite your listeners if they go to jimharold.com, j-i-m-h-a-r-o-l-d.com. I always spell it because sometimes people get it uh, mixed up. If they can go and click on campfire sign up at the top of the page and sign up for a time slot for me to call them, and they could tell me their story, and they'll be featured on the program. And uh, I do the, those sessions every week and would love to hear uh, your uh, your listeners' stories of strange. And it's not just ghost stories. It's cryptozoology. It's UFOs, premonitions, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, uh, all kinds of things. Have you ever seen a ghost or a UFO? I mean, you you shared your premonition story, but have you ever seen No, I have not. No, I have not, but my... <clears throat> my dad, and it's in the book, there's a great story. And my dad, you'd have to know my dad, he was a steel worker. Uh, he's in his mid-70s now, but uh blue-collar guy. Definitely does not sleep with pyramids under his bed. And uh, just kind of a tell-it-like-it-is guy. Um, and he has a great UFO story in the book. So not that, no, wait a minute, I did see something. And now, see, when I think of UFO, a lot of times I'll fall into the Take me to your leader, I like the thing. But the one thing my wife and I did see, and we saw this, you know, in a well-populated area, and we know it wasn't our imagination. I tend to think maybe it was space junk, but probably about, I'm guessing about, gosh, must have been 10 or 15 years ago. I think we were married. Uh, we were traveling, and I live in the northeastern Ohio area, so in the Cleveland area. We were in a Cleveland suburb, well-known suburb, highly populated, <clears throat> on a main road, and we saw what appeared to be a green fireball re-entering the atmosphere. And it was funny because we had a talk radio show on, listening to it. This must have been about, and it, it wasn't late at night. It was it was probably, must have been winter because it was dark. It was probably about 6 o'clock at night. And a guy calls in the radio station, hey, I'm in such, such and such place, and I'm seeing this green fireball in the sky. And the radio host kind of laughed at me. He's like, yeah, right. And I'm like, no, there's a green fireball in the sky. We both see it. (laughs) And I never heard another thing about it again. But years later, getting into the Paranormal Report, our video podcast, I realized there are a lot of reports of green fireballs. Now, I don't necessarily think that's extraterrestrial or anything interdimensional. I think it could be something as mundane as a uh, some space junk or a meteorite re-entering the atmosphere or something like that, but but it is technically an unidentified flying object, which would make it a UFO. Yes, it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> it sure would. Until they we explain both thought, it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I I, uh, I I do not. Again, I do not discount any uh, any uh, paranormal report. I think you have to take each report and look at it on its own merits. Uh, just because it's reported doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean it's false. You look at the case and you try to figure it out, and, and a lot of times you just can't figure it out. Well, I mean, but it even you even hear stories coming out of the the hardcore UFO community where they will go and investigate a case and, you know, looking at radar, looking at all kinds of things, and they can't explain it, which makes you go, hmm. Now, I will say this on the UFO phenomena. I believe that there's, uh, because there's so many variables, and so many of us are untrained 
and what to look for, including myself. I'm just a lay person, and, and that's one thing I like to make clear. You know, I'm a seeker. I'm an investigator in the sense that I want to ask questions, but I'm not an expert. I'm not a guru, as it were. Uh, you know, I've had people write me for spiritual advice and things, and I said, that's not me. I just ask the questions. To me, I'm an extension of the listener. I'm curious. That's in a way, I've educated myself about the subject matter and brought my listeners along with me in that process. They've been like my classmates, and um, I really like that. I, I've never used that before. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna use that in you know, my classmates. But um, and I lost my train of thought there for a minute. But but I am not an expert. But what I will say on on UFOs is what I believe is is that many times uh, two big categories are. Uh, something in the sky uh, astronomically, you know, some planets or stars or different things. I think that accounts for a lot of sightings. Another thing that I think accounts for a ton of sightings are military experiments. For example, just recently, maybe your listeners have seen in the last month or so, there's been reports of uh, the, the, this new hypersonic plane that they were testing. And if you saw any artist's renderings of it, it looks like the traditional triangle UFOs that have been reported over the world in places like Belgium. That leads me to believe that, at least in some of these cases where these things are being reported, that they're being mistaken for military aircraft. Another another example of that is a great book that I would recommend after you buy Jim Harold's Campfire True Ghost Stories. <laughs> the next thing the next thing you might want to put into your cart if you're interested in UFO history is a book called Area 51 by Annie Jacobson, who is an excellent journalist. And uh, I believe she did a lot of work for either the L.A. Times or Los Angeles Magazine, I can't remember which, but a mainstream journalist who did this thick tome on Area 51, that famous uh, military CIA base out in the, the American Southwest. And she said, you know, a huge amount of UFO sightings in the 1950s were people... Um, even pilots mistaking things like U-2 spy planes, because the, the first thing the pilot would think is, well, that can't be a plane. A plane can't fly that high, or a plane can't fly that fly that fast. So I believe in a small percentage of cases there's something weird going on with UFOs that may be of otherworldly uh, origin. But I also believe that a large part are people mistaking uh, heavenly bodies for, for UFOs, and mistaking uh, military uh, military craft. And the thing about UFOs I love, and this constantly happens, when you hear of a big UFO sighting in a metropolitan area, the first thing the TV says is like, well, we talked to effect, uh, officials at XYZ Air Force Base, and they said there was no unusual activity in airspace. And the thing that I would think is, well, let's think about this a moment. Let's take two different scenarios. Let's take the fact if it were ETs and our government knew it. If a TV station calls up the local Air Force Base, are they going to say, oh, you got us? Yeah, it's ETs, absolutely. Or, <laughs> I don't think so. The second thing is if it's a military experiment, A, the local Air Force Base might not even know about it because there's so many layers behind these things that they're not going to necessarily know. And if they do know, they're certainly not going to tell you. So that always just gives me a laugh the way the mainstream media sometimes covers these things because, well, the local XYZ Air Force Base said there was no unusual activity in the local airspace. And it's like, well, they're not going to tell you, sorry, Mr. Anger. <laughs> but in the meantime, you know, everybody's got pictures <laughs> yep. oh, and yeah. video footage, and it's like, yeah, and here's like, me, you know, drinking this beer and like watching this perfect... UFO fly over. Exactly, and those are the ones that really get me. You know, I don't get too terribly excited these days if there's one photo or if there's one uh, piece of video because, uh, like I said before, all of those things so easily can be faked. But when you're talking about multiple pieces of video and multiple reports, now perfect example is the Phoenix Lights from the 1990s, but an even more mm -hmm. recent example in the last two weeks, or not two weeks, excuse me. Um, the, it was actually last month back in September. Um, something that happened over uh, southwest, uh, uh, the southwest of the U.S. And actually, if you go back to my paranormal report, I believe it's episode 82, 
we share some video of that. And there were multiple, multiple sightings across the American Southwest of some very strange things. And the, the, the Weather Service said something in fact, oh, it could be a meteorite. Well, they were showing some of the footage, uh, and it was flying in all kinds of strange directions, like unless the meteorite has a pilot, I have no idea how that could be a meteorite. So, and, and they had multiple pieces of video and multiple people over a large geographic area reporting it. Those are the ones that capture my imagination. I agree. There was someone had posted a UFO sighting on YouTube, and they said, look, there are multiple uh, crafts flying around the air, and they're showing this footage, and you can see little strings hanging off the bottom of the UFO. Oh, yeah. But and that's it's like, hello, even... dude, did you look at your own video? Can't you see the strings hanging <laughs> yeah, off the Yeah, well, the thing is, is that those, 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 are, those are actually less harmless than the ones that are done well. Because the ones that have strings hanging from them, you can look at it and say, oh, that's a fake. It's kind of like some of the Bigfoot things. We On Paranormal Report, we showed a video of one a while back, uh, maybe even last year, and we were laughing at it because it was so obviously fake. And the thing is, is that what's scary is, is that today with CGI and computer graphics capability, people can do really well done fakes that can fool, you know, an intelligent person. And that's what's scary about it. And what I hate about that is that then the closed-minded skeptic who has absolutely no intellectual honesty in terms of being open-minded can say, see, they're all fake. So those people do us no favors. The the hoaxers, the fakers, the people who put up the bad UFO video, the bad cryptozoology, the, 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 the crypto uh, videos, the, the, the fake ghost videos, those people do, those of us who are genuinely interested in getting to the bottom of this, they do us no favors. They are not our friends. I don't even understand the mentality behind it. I can understand the person that put up the one with the multiple UFOs with the strings dangling off. I mean, that was an honest belief. Obviously, he didn't watch his own footage. But with that said, um, it wasn't, you know, he just took the footage and said, hey, this is what I caught. I can get that. I don't understand the person that will spend the hours it takes to put together some good, clean film it, footage and then post it to have it be a hoax. I don't understand that mentality. At all. No, I it's like, know you it's like to... you know, creating computer viruses, you know, to take people's exactly. computers down. Exactly. It, I don't get it. it. Makes no, I don't get it either. Now, since we're we're, we're headed towards Halloween, um, I'm guessing. Would you like to hear another story or two from the book? Oh, I want to hear the. Well, actually, let's save the spookiest story for the end. <laughs> How's about one that is just plain weird? Well, here's a one's weird. I'm just going to read it verbatim. It's a little long, but we'll, we'll be able to get to it. And if we if I were running long on it, I'll shorten it up a little bit. This is called Staying for the Credits. It was the first or second week of April in 2004, and my wife and I decided to go see a movie. This is one of my listeners. Hellboy had just come out, so we went to the local movie theater. It was just a typical day. He wasn't sure if it was a Saturday or Sunday, but they drove to the movie theater, pulled up, purchased tickets, for the matinee show at 2.45. They purchased the tickets, went in and did the typical things that you do. They went to the concession counter and purchased popcorn and a soda. Then they proceeded into one of the movie theaters. It was one of these big cineplexes that have multiple screens, seven or ten screens, something like that. So they went over to the ticket taker, and they ripped their tickets in half, and they pointed in the right direction. We proceeded to go towards our theater and went inside. Now, he says he always likes to get to the theater a little earlier because he didn't like to fumble around when it's dark and they're playing the previous. So they entered at 2.30 or 2.35, something like that. So they would have been about 10 minutes early. He said, when we got there and pushed through the doors and went in, the lights were already down and there was already something on the screen playing. And I said, oh, darn it. He figured that they'd come in, you know, at the in the middle of the movie, but he, he didn't understand. He said, so we had to fumble around to find a seat, kind of in the middle center, and we thought the previews were playing. After sitting down for a minute or so, my wife and I kind of looked at each other and said, these aren't previews. It was actually the ending of the movie they had gone to see. So anyway, 
the end of the movie played, and they, they couldn't figure out what's going on. So they both got up to go, and he got up first, and he stopped someone on the way out, and he said, you know, I'm curious, what show is this? And the gentleman said this was the 245 show, the show that they were supposed to go. So that was the show that they were going to see. And he said he didn't think much of it, and he went back over to his wife, and he said this gentleman said that this was a 245 show, which was the show they were going to go see. So they got up and followed everybody out. When they went to the lobby, he said he saw the kid who took his ticket literally minutes ago. He said, you remember me? And he said, yes. And uh, he said, sure, I remember you. He said, uh, and uh, my listener said, we had tickets to go see the 245 show. Yeah, and he said, yeah, the one that just let out. And then my listener looked down at his watch. He's very much a stickler for time. And the time on his watch read 447. So when he entered the theater, it was 235, 230, something like that. But when they left, it was 447. He said he looked at his wife, checked her watch, and we realized that something wasn't right. How could it be 447 when we just walked into the movie theater? He said they looked at each other. They went into the theater and spoke about it. They checked all the clocks. And then they had realized when they got outside, that the sun had gone down. They realized, essentially, that they had lost about two hours of time, and they still have no idea where that two hours went. They walked in, and it was like two hours had evaporated, and that was the only theater in that particular uh, complex where that movie was playing, so it couldn't have been that they walked in the wrong theater. So just mysteriously vanishing time. I think that's pretty creepy. Well, it makes me go, ooh, I wonder if they were abducted. I don't know. I'm not sure what happened. Now, um, That uh, is weird. Yeah, it is weird. He said that at the time he was attending a lot of movies to cheer himself up. He had been a cancer patient. Luckily, everything has gone very well. And... uh, so um, so I'm glad things have gone well for him. But that missing time, that's a very mysterious thing. That is mysterious. Um, let's see. What other kind of story do I want to hear? What about one where it was uplifting or healing for the person having the experience? Actually, we have some in the book like that. One of my favorite is called Love is Like a Butterfly. And it, it's poignant. There's some sadness in it. But basically the, the situation was there was a young girl, must have been about a college-age girl, I'm guessing, and she worked for her family. Uh, her family had a car lot. So she was going in the morning and checking the cars to make sure that they hadn't been vandalized or anything over the night. And uh, essentially what happened was is that she found a dead butterfly on the ground. And for some reason, it had a visceral reaction. And she started crying. And she went inside, and her mom was there because it was a family business, and she was crying and crying, and her mother didn't understand why. And she was crying over this butterfly, and, and the girl had no particular affinity towards butterflies, but she was crying. So she calmed down a little bit. Uh, about that time, and I'm paraphrasing the story, Uh, I hope I've got my timing right exactly, but it's in the book. Um, They got a call that her grandfather had been rushed to the hospital. Now, her grandfather had been ill, but nothing imminent or anything like that. He wasn't in the best of health, but there was no concern about it. And she was going to stay and and watch the place. And I said, don't worry, don't go to the hospital. And then uh, after her mom had gone to the hospital and so forth, uh, she got the call. She uh, she got the call that uh, that her grandfather had passed away. So anyway, she was inconsolable. She went to the family home. She locked herself in her room. And there were already people there, and it was in the south, so you know people were bringing food in and everything like they do down there, which is a great tradition, by the way. Um, and she just was so upset. She said, "I have to leave and go for a drive." So she went for a drive, and she ended up on these country roads that she doesn't even remember ever seeing before. Didn't even know where she'd driven, hasn't seen a place before since. She found this, like, park in this beautiful roadside area. 
and she parked, and she sat down. And all of a sudden, tons, and this wasn't an unusual, I believe this was an unusual time of the year when you wouldn't see them at all, hardly. She said something like dozen, or, or more than a dozen, butterflies showed up. These beautiful butterflies. And they were in her hair, and they were in her face, and they were all over her. And um, she had no idea where they came from. She'd never seen so many butterflies in her life. They all gathered around her. And then, I guess as quickly as they were there, then they were gone. And, and she felt a calming and a peace through that. And she says even to this day, when her or her mom are feeling depressed or feeling down, they'll look outside, most unusual times of the year, and what will they see, a beautiful tiger butterfly. So I thought that was an uplifting story. To me, that was, again, back to the communication, another way of communicating, saying, I'm okay. I mean, the the, the kind of... The irony of first finding the dead butterfly, that finding many of them, and, and that to me, in a way, that was uh, it was an ending, but it was also a new beginning for her, mm-hmm. and her grandfather. Wonderful, Jim. We have about five or six minutes left, so maybe we could squish in one or two more. Let's let's do spooky. Let's end on a scary Halloween note. Yes. Well, let's 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 think here. Let me take a quick look and see which one that I want to give you. Do, 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 do. Give me a second here. I, just, I want to pick a really good one. A really good one. You know, the the thing is, is that there's so many stories. You know, I laugh sometimes. People will say it's kind of like a kind of like asking which one's your favorite kid. Here's a good one. Mm-hmm. One of my favorites from <laughs> the United Kingdom. Um, uh, this is his son-in-law telling the story. His mother-in-law was in in hospital, as they say in England, and the National Health, and she was being treated. And all of a sudden, over the course, I guess, of an evening or two, this woman would keep coming, a nurse, asking her if she wants some tea. Now, I guess that wouldn't be unusual in England. They love their tea. The one thing that was strange about the woman, though, was is that she was in a very old style nurse's uniform, the old the old white hat, and kind of something you probably would have seen in the thirties or the forties or the fifties. Certainly not the scrubs that that are common now in, in, in hospitals. You know, the prototypical remember when we were kids, you'd see a picture of a nurse like uh and it would be the one with the hat, with the little cross. Mm-hmm. That 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 kind of scarf. And she thought it was odd, but she took the tea. And she had occasion to later on go back to the hospital. And she mentioned to one of the employees, she said, uh, it was the most unusual thing. When I was here last time, there was this nurse. And she kept coming and asking me if she wanted tea. She was very pleasant. She didn't talk a lot. When I asked her about the uniform, she didn't say much. Who would have that been on your staff? And she said, well, actually, that wasn't technically anybody that was on our staff. That was Flo. And this woman said, well, who is Flo? Flo was our resident ghost. So <laughs> you never know who might be offering you a, a spot of tea next time you're in the hospital in the, in the UK. Well, I think the best part is I would think she got the tea or might have complained that uh, Flo wasn't doing her job too good. Well, I don't know, but... But, I, I mean, it's one thing to see something, but to actually be served a beverage by a ghost, I thought Correct. that was pretty unique. And that's one of my – that's actually the first story in the book. And um, that's the thing about the book. It's 73 stories, and I think we've only covered maybe three or four that are in the in the book, so there's a lot there. I, I would love it if your listeners would check uh, out everything I do. There, there, again, as I said, there's hundreds of free podcasts at jimherald.com, J-I-M-H-A-R-O-L-D, Campfire Paranormal Report Paranormal Podcast. And um, the the thing of it is is that uh, there, there's a lot of content there, so if you're into the paranormal. And then also I would love it if they could check out the book, and there's links all there for, for all the various outlets for the, the book and so forth, and even a way that you can get your copy uh, signed. 
So I'd love it if people could mm. check that all out, jimharold.com, J-I-M-H-A-R-O-L-D.com. And again, I, I thank you so much for your kind invitation. It's been so much fun talking with you. Well, and it's been great talking with a compatriot in the ghost world, in the paranormal, you know, <laughs> alter- I see, I call it the alternative world because it's not – to me, paranormal is kind of ghosty. That's why I like, you know, alternative, like alternative thought. I like well, that I think it is. I think it is alternative to an extent, but I think it is becoming less so because I think people realize that the paranormal is normal because I think most of us experience it, if not all of us. So it is a fascinating area, and I have a feeling if I live to be 100, there will still be plenty of questions and plenty of fascinating things to explore in the topic. <laughs> Very well said. Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. The music's going to be coming up here in just a second. And um, I'm looking forward for your next book of great stories to come out. To ha- and we can have you back on and we can be scared some more. I like it. I like the sound of that. I'm looking forward to it. I'll hold you to that invitation. Well, okay. do do it's like I have a long feeder on this. You know my pain. It's like, do 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 do. <laughs> I keep Isn't going. I'm going to cut it off. The there it is. There it is. All right, Jim. Happy Halloween. I will talk Happy to you Halloween. again soon. And everybody listening, I hope you have a great Halloween, and I will talk to you in November. And don't forget. Uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving, we're doing the open phone line so you can call in, share your stories, get a reading, or just join the fun. So until then, I'm Dr. Rita Louise. This is Just Energy Radio. Be blessed. Join host Dr. Rita Louise each week at this time for Just Energy Radio. Point your browser to www.justenergyradio.com for more show information and to contact Dr.